Um, anyway, tonight we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about some unique garden ideas. So hopefully tonight's going to be more fun and maybe just get y'all mulling over some things. Maybe you could incorporate in your backyards, in your home landscapes, uh, maybe this year or even into the future. And as always, um, this is going to be in the Google Drive. The presentation is with a lot of different links in it on the various garden themes we're going to be talking about. And uh, the video will be live linked hopefully by tomorrow afternoon. And there's additional resources in the Google Drive and in the web portal. Um, if you all have questions or comments, uh, tonight's a great opportunity to share those in the chat box. Um, as you know, I always share those with everybody. And just a shout out to Pam and Mary last week, Big Spring Master Gardeners jumped in and, and were responding to questions y'all have. Because when I'm doing this, I can't see that. So thanks to them. I think I think both of them are on tonight, actually. So if you have questions, don't hesitate to put them in there. They'll get them answered, or I'll come back and answer those later and send those out to you as well. So um, July registration is open. Don't forget that. We're going to be talking about all things pesky, uh, from disease, weeds, insects, uh, noxious weeds, all that good stuff, with a little bit of history and lore included in, in some of those presentations. Um, next week, we're not live but you'll be getting some information via email so be on the lookout for that and with that I'm going to shut up and we're going to jump in here and, and have a little fun tonight with some unique garden ideas. So as I always um, tell most people that know me well is that I'm inside the box. The box is my safe place right but when it comes to some of these garden ideas it's about thinking outside the box and put a uh, box and putting your own creative spin on things. So I, I thought I would start out with one of my favorites just because it's easier to talk about for me because I do have a moon garden or a moonlight garden as you'll hear that referred to uh, pretty frequently. Just to give you a heads up um, the Farmer's Almanac has a really great article on creating and maintaining a moonlight garden. So that link is in there for, um, for your reference. Uh, remember that there's going to be four different types of plants that we're going to include in these moonlight gardens. What makes them a moonlight garden are going to be plants with white flowers, with a really bright silvery foliage, um, or even like a translucent even the paper bark birch would be considered a uh, moonlight plant. Um, anything that's got bright foliage, anything that's going to bloom at night, and then anything that has a fragrant bloom at night, because we actually do have plants that only bloom at night and some that only release scent um, at night. So basically a moon garden is just highlighting nocturnal plants that are thriving um, at night, you're basically creating a space to be able to enjoy the moonlight. Even when we don't have a full moon, it's somewhere, you know, it's just a, a place to be able to gather your thoughts in, in your garden. Um, to kick us off, we'll start with the moonflower. So this is a plant that looks very similar to the morning glory. Some of you might have a love-hate relationship with morning glories, or as I call them, glory mornings. Uh, but the moonflower is going to be basically the opposite of the morning glory because it is going to bloom at night. Um, it is related to the morning glory, but again, as soon as that morning glory starts fading off, this is when we have the moonflower starting to open. Um, this one's pretty simple. These are going to be white lilies. Any of those Asiatic lilies as you can see from that color. Of course we've got different colors but the white's what makes it a moon garden plant. Um, they've got a really nice lovely gentle scent as well and then when we look at the lore behind lilies a lot of people like to create um, gardens with the moon that actually have some kind of meaning to them. So folks will look at these lilies and associate that with rebirth and fertility. So if any of you attended the Easter class back in April, you heard me speak to the Easter lily quite frequently. So sometimes you'll also have that lore um, included. This is the evening primrose. Many of you probably have seen these in yellow colors. Um, we can use that one as well in the moonlight garden just because it is really bright. Um, sometimes you will see the pink like you see here, but they have a really nice um, fragrance, which is why a lot of folks like to use those in the moon gardens. And when we look at the lore behind those, they're linked to the fairies or the little people. If y'all remember from some of our Appalachian culture classes um, last year. And the evening primrose is also associated with love. This is the tube rose. Uh, some of you may remember this because this is the primary ingredient in, in uh, Chanel number no. five perfume, but it's 
it's the smell, it's the fragrance, it's not blooming. That's what lends itself to be a great moonlight plant, moon garden plant. This one here is the Cyclamens, and you can see it's a really nice dainty flower. So if you also have a water garden attraction, this goes really well with that, um, especially if you, you can kind of see that here, it's planted in amongst rocks. So it really kind of highlights that um, as well. But when we look at the lore um, in regard to the moon, a lot of people will associate that with happiness and fertility. And then we have the not blooming Jasmine which is another one that, uh, well, actually the jasmine is ruled by the moon when, you, when we look at the folklore, um, but it's very striking in the moonlight. And of course, hence the name, um, it's gonna release that fragrance also at night. Uh, this is one you hear me talk about in, uh, as a companion plant with potatoes, but this is the sweet alyssum, but it's really pretty um, when we intermingle that amongst uh, rock gardens, along the borders, um, really low growing, it creeps along and it's just really pretty. And it is actually associated with protection uh, from the moon. If you uh, prefer natives, and this is kind of where I've kind of fall into this spectrum, I prefer some of these dicentra species. We've talked about these and you'll actually be introduced to some of these next week. But anything in the dicentra family, which is the squirrel corn that you see here or the uh, Dutchman breeches or any of the fringe bleeding heart, bleeding hearts, any of those are going to fall into this category. Of course, they're spring ephemerals, so they're only gonna bloom in the springtime, but it's gonna give you that pop of color before anything else really shows, shows up in, in your garden. Now this time of year, of course, we see daisies and we see those intermingled uh, along roadsides and the medians and the pastures and hayfields. Um, but this is one a lot of us will purposely plant um, as well, just because it's such a delicate and pretty flower. A biennial species that we like in those moon gardens are gonna be the foxgloves. And you'll notice that we've got an array of those pastel colors. You can use any of those, those will glow by the moon, um, but a lot of people just prefer the white, but also a really pretty specimen. And then if you do have a, a, ward, a water garden feature or a pond or something, and we'll look at some of those here in a few minutes, anywhere that you can add these water lilies, um, is gonna be a really pretty addition. And some of the water lilies, and these are linked, I can't remember the names, but some of them only bloom at night as well, which makes a really pretty addition. Now, like I said before, we can't forget the foliage. So many of you are probably familiar with the lamb's ears, those little fuzzy, well, they look like fuzzy little lamb's ears, but this is a great specimen to have um, in our rock gardens. One that I didn't put in here for the moon garden is whorehound. Um, I don't know, it, I just thought of it when I saw the Artemisia here, but any of those Artemisia species, any of the wormwoods, whorehound, any of those, um, even some of the native mints like the horse mints are gonna have that silvery foliage that would be really pretty um, cast, you know, casting light by the moon. Hostas, those will also work. Um, a lot of people don't think about the hostas because of this color here, like we see, but they really truly glow, uh, especially in a shade garden area. And you know, we don't have a lot of options when it comes to having a moon garden in the, in the shade often, but these work really nice. And we cannot mention a, a moon garden without talking about the, the angel trumpets. Um, these get really big. You can see that they're actually planted in pots here. Um, I used to have my deck covered with these things, but they kind of get big and out of hand. And then I had raccoons visiting and they would just, you know, trash them all over my porch. So I just finally gave, gave it up because the raccoons were winning five to one. So I just let them have it. But the reason I really like these is because of the smell. The scent is just absolutely perfect. And they only release that scent at night. So if you're thinking about a moon garden, really investigate this plant here. The angel trumpets are, are really, really cool. And you can kind of see how they droop down. Um, of course, they too bloom in the evening. So they're not going to be, they're not going to be really pretty during the day. And a lot of times those blooms will drop off overnight, but a very pleasant scent. If you like the peonies or peony or pineys, depending on where you're from. Uh, the, the peony roses make a really pretty um, addition as a landscape border. And these really grow or glow when you have these growing in masses. It's unbelievable how much they will shine through. 
Uh, same way with white roses, if you have a border or an edge for those. And of course, we know that um, white roses, again, going back to the lore of the moon, is going to be associated with love and opening your heart and forgiveness. So this just shows you a plant, or a, not a plant, a garden, actually what that moon garden would look like. Um, it's all up to you um, how you plant these and intersperse those. But you can also see here just from the rocks that they've included. Of course, we're going to get a little bit of a glow from that as well. Uh, we've got some contrast that's intermingled here, different sizes, different shapes of things. So, it, and again, you can use specifically natives if you prefer, or you can um, utilize hybrids, just kind of whatever your preference is. Um, even including some of those tropical plants we're going to talk about a little bit later. But the thing the thing to remember is that it's your personal space and it really is quite lovely to just dedicate a corner of your your garden or your landscape just as a place to to be able to enjoy um, the moonlight and you can see here they've actually built a trellis an arbor with some vining plants i'm not sure what that is um, but even including some of our annuals uh, the new guinea and patience along with dusty miller don't forget those to fill in some bare spots to get you through the summer and again, it's just all about enjoying the moonlight. So you can see how they painted that white. So that would be a really, I mean, that would, it would be in, even in the dark, it would be a, a very well lit area within the garden. Speaking of light, there went mine. <laughs> um, and again, if you don't have a lot of space, you can incorporate these even, even along the driveway. You don't have to have a lot of space, but just something kind of cool to try out. Now from the moon gardens, we'll jump into the tea gardens. And if you were with us last week, then you know that um, true tea actually only comes from the Camilla sinensis family. So typically we're not gonna be growing that in our home landscapes. I'll try to turn my light on. I don't think that's gonna work. So anyway, um, but we learned that tisane or tisane is what we actually grow all these plants that you see pictured here on the screen. But for, um, all intents and purposes, we're just going to refer to them um, as tea, but technically we know that it's a tisane. But uh, we know that there are so many plants that we're probably already growing that are suitable to use as a tea. And again, that's going to be a matter of personal preference, what you like best, what grows best for you. Uh, you know, space is going to be an issue. Uh, you can actually utilize fresh. Right now is the perfect uh, time of year to be utilizing some of those or you can air dry those and store those um, throughout the winter. A lot of these we can actually store until the next season. Uh, notice there you don't want to be removing too many leaves at once because you could kill the plant. Remember we want to leave about a quarter of the, the plant foliage on there so it can keep producing food. And then if you are going to use these, um, any of these plants for teas, just be very careful about your use of pesticides. And that's probably just preaching to the choir and you all know that, but just want to throw that out there to make sure um, we're not getting any chemicals on there. So we'll start out with a few, some that you all are going to recognize, but lavender, of course, is one that we all love and enjoy. But when it comes to making tea, lavender is actually known for curing a headache, y'all. So I don't know if some of y'all knew that or not, but uh, very good for headaches, but it's got a very floral fragrance. So if you're not into the floral-like teas, then it's probably one you're not going to care for too much. Uh, speaking of floral, this one too, it's, it's citrus, of course, lemon verbena, but it's going to help with joint pain. It also helps with like asthma issues, any kind of allergy issues. So this is a good one to be drinking in the summertime, as well as uh, one of our most loved mints, the lemon balm, um, and, the, and just any of the mints in general. This one, I'm not sure which one this is. This is not the lemon balm. This is just the mint. Um, but mint, of course, is can take over the universe. So just be sure to contain that in pots or put it in an area um, where it's going to be, you know, not in your way. It can be invasive. And we've got so many different kinds of mint. So I get asked that a lot. Can you intermingle those? And you can, but you just want to be dividing those from time to time to give you enough airflow. You don't want to get mildew coming in um, on any of those mints. So if you've got a dedicated space, you can have the apple, the banana, uh, the pineapple, the chocolate, the peppermint, the spearmint. You can mix all those together. You've got the orange mint. It's not going to affect flavor of any of those. You just want to give enough airflow to prevent disease. So that would be the biggest thing. 
here's the lemon balm. Um, it is, again, very closely related to mint. I think it's actually a little bit more invasive than some of our other mint species, so be careful uh, with that. But this is a really nice one to have um, as a garnish or to make a tea all throughout the summer. Uh, ginger tea, we talked about that last week. Um, the ginger root, we can mix that with other herbs and make it a warming tea. Very good if you've got sore throats or any kind of joint ailments there too. Um, and it does help in digestion. So if you've got a tummy ache, it's one of the best known teas that we can drink to cure that ailment. Thyme, we know that this one, um, you heard me talk about this one last week, it's antiseptic, but it is going to help with any kind of stomach ailments. It's going to help freshen breath. Uh, you can also use the flowers. Just remember, if you do let it bloom, then it's going to, this is a woody um, plant, so it's going to make this a little bit woodier, and you're going to lose some of that oil, the, the oils and the flavor. Um, this is going to be uh, the chamomile, of course, good for relaxation and sleep very easy to grow. You can harvest this and store it for about a year. It's got those nice apple scented blossoms, so you can use those both in the tea. And of course, we've got German and Roman chamomile. Um, there is a little bit of difference in the flavor. Some people will mix them because they don't think it's a, a big enough of a difference, but there is a tiny difference there, so be aware of that. And there's some links in there that kind of discuss the difference in those two. Uh, we talked about jasmine a few minutes ago with the moon plant. We can also utilize jasmine as a tea. You can just pick those fresh flowers. Again, it's going to be very floral, so be um, mindful of that. Um, jasmine's kind of questionable in our area. Some people have success with it, some do not. So here in Northeast Tennessee, we're kind of maybe riding that line as far as the zone. So some people will just put it in pots. Some people incorporate in the landscape and come in in the fall, cover it with a lot of straw, pine, um, pine bark mulch, pine needles, and that kind of thing. So just be aware of that. And then, of course, we have stevia. You can actually just steep a tea just with the stevia, or you can use it as a sweetener in other things. But a lot of people uh, with diabetes will just drink the stevia tea itself. And then marjoram, a lot of people don't think about marjoram, but uh, this one actually lends itself to a, um, a really mild flavor. And a lot of people swear that um, it's great for any kind of stones, like salivary stones, gallstones, kidney stones, anything like that in, in, the, in the body. Uh, this is my most dreaded herb, cilantro, but I wasn't gonna be mean and leave it out for y'all. But uh, we usually think about it as a garnish, but it actually uh, can be utilized in a tea um, as well. So if you've ever drank Lady Grey tea, so now this, see, this makes perfect sense to me because I don't like cilantro and I'm not big on Lady Grey tea, even though I love tea. So now it makes sense why I don't like Lady Grey, but it does taste very similar to Lady Grey when you steep it as a tea. And of course you can, um, reduce the acidity by adding honey to it, and a lot of people swear that it, it actually helps clear toxins from the from the body, just the cilantro alone. Uh, rosemary, we, we know that that helps improve our memory, but it also aids in digestion. It, it helps um, with heart disease, vascular tone, and that kind of thing. Um, it's not just for fall. A lot of people kind of leave rosemary for a lot of those fall dishes or just heavy meat dishes, but it's really nice as a as a tea. It's very refreshing. And we talked about this last week too, but fennel, um, I wanted to make sure that we mentioned that. Um, believe it or not, I've even heard of people using dill seeds to make a tea as well. So a lot of different herbs that you can experiment with, and any of these you can actually um, mix together and kind of create your own blends. And remember, when it comes to teas versus tisanes. Remember when we talked last week, tea has to have a specific boiling point. You have to steep it for so long, depending on what color it is and all that good, all that good stuff. And so it's almost kind of cumbersome. But with all of these herbs, it's pretty much the same recipe for all of them. You're just picking the fresh leaves. Um, you're steeping them in, in hot boiling water um, for however, to the desired strength, however you prefer it. Um, here's another one is St. John's wort. Of course, this one, you know, is touted for a lot of um, health benefits, but especially like relieving depression, um, anxiety, and that kind of thing. So this is one that's blooming pretty profusely right now. 
And then this is sage. Uh, we use sage for multiple things, kind of like rosemary. Um, it, we think about it as a more of a fall herb, I guess. But this is another one that you can utilize um, as a tea. And many people will mix fresh sage with dried sage. Now, I've never done it that way before, but they say that it actually um, may, it improves the taste. So for whatever reason, that might be an experiment to try in regard to that. Here's a really dainty flower. We know that we can eat this one. Uh, we call it the, the wild pansies, the um, Johnny Jump Ups, the Violas, lots of different names. Um, but this is one that you can steep into a tea that's really great for sore throats and allergies as well. And then the, the king of all basils is the holy basil, but you can make a tea of any of the basils, but the holy basil, the Tulsa basil is the one that's most noted. Um, you can add honey and ginger to that, make a lot of different um, concoctions um, using just the Tulsa. And then we have, um, what is this one, catnip? Yeah, this is not just for cats, y'all. Um, this is for even, it doesn't have the same effect on us that it, that it would um, for cats. It makes my cat crazy. Some of y'all's cats, it might sedate them, but mine kind of goes a little nuts. So on people, it's said to have more sedative type effects, um, even good for sleeping. And then lemongrass is one um, we don't think about steeping into a tea, but it does. And it is also a great companion plant because it helps repel white flies in the garden. So you're getting a dual purpose for a lot of these plants that we can um, make into teas. Of course, we don't want to forget the bee balms, um, perennial flower, but we can eat those blossoms. We can actually steep those in a tea. It actually has a hint of citrus to, to the taste. And then the whorehound, um, it's got a really nice licorice flavor. I'm not I'm not personally big on licorice, so if you're like me and you don't like licorice, don't snub your nose at whorehound because it's very mild. It's um, it's got a unique flavor, but very, uh, very good also for um, sore throats. And you can also, I don't have a picture here, but the, the blossoms are also good to use in the tea. And then nasturtiums too. It, uh, nasturtiums um, naturally have antibiotic properties built into them. So it's really good to um, have those in the wintertime. You can dry the flowers and of course the seeds themselves. Uh, some people will steep those, but that's what we call the poor man's caper. So you can actually preserve those uh, for quite a lengthy time and have those to utilize. And then just a few more here, the corn flowers, we're starting to see those bloom now. Uh, you steep that long enough, it'll be a really pretty blue color, you know, or you can just use the, the petals in the tea. And same way with the calendula, uh, we use this for a multitude of things. You hear me talk about calendula all the time, um, but this is just one of those superpowers in the garden. Don't forget about the weeds growing in y'all's yard. Red clover has some really great benefits. It actually has been touted to be able to help with the reduction of allergies. Uh, you can harvest the buds and actually just use them fresh or dried. Um, drying them is really easy, so don't, don't neglect those. Make sure you get out there and harvest those now to have those into um, the cooler months. And you can see they're just kind of finishing up the tea gardens with picture. Um, you can see we don't have to have a lot of space to grow these. Um, hyssop is another one that I didn't mention there a few minutes ago, but it being in the mint family, anything that you, you know, your preference, your taste, you can create a tea out of it pretty much. Just make sure to research it and um, know that you're not getting anything that, that is bad for you. But most of the time we don't get into some of those toxic properties unless we're talking about the, the fruit, the berries, the seeds or something like that. So with a lot of these um, herbs, we're not going to get into an issue like that. So from teas, we're going to jump into wildlife gardens. And for this part of the presentation, I focus more on attracting wildlife rather than deterring wildlife. But on the web portal, there, um, let's see, there's a couple of publications on deer resistant plants and one on rabbit resistant plants. So if that is an issue, make sure you check, check those out. But basically what we're trying to create with a wildlife garden is just working in tandem with the environment that we've got. Um, and we're not just talking about bears and deers, we're talking about even the songbirds. You know, we want to provide an environment where if they're already there, that they're going to be able to thrive. 
and we're going to allow those populations to continue um, to grow. Knowing your bird species is going to kind of help you figure out what specific kind of bird feed um, to have on hand um, and also acknowledging we don't want to feed the birds maybe all year long. Um, as it starts warming up in the springtime we might want to encourage them to to eat the the bad bugs, um, some of those pesky critters that we've got starting to emerge from the winter time. So my poor birds at home don't get any food until it starts getting cold again. So I'm kind of mean like that, but they've got plenty, uh, plenty to eat. One thing, especially for this time of year, is to provide a bird bath. It doesn't have to be as festive as this one. Something just really simple that you've got um, interspersed throughout your garden will really encourage those populations to come in. And I don't know if I have a picture in here in a few minutes, but while I'm on that subject with birds, um, in the fall, as we start cleaning up the garden, and you know, I, I harp on that quite a bit, cleaning up, um, sanitizing our fence posts and our tools and all that stuff, putting them to bed for winter. But one of the things with our plants, especially those perennial plants, and I'm OCD, I like everything neat and tidy, but if you leave all of that brush, uh, for the birds. They've got a nesting place for the winter. They've got somewhere to kind of hide out. Plus they're eating all those seed heads and everything that we've, that they, that has been spent through the summer months. So sometimes it can be a little unsightly, but just know that you're actually encouraging those populations of birds um, to stay. When we do talk about wildlife species, a lot of times this is where the berry and the nut trees and the fruit trees are going to come into play. And again, um, not everybody's going, going to want to encourage wildlife species, but if you do, um, this is where it's going to be at. Um, any of these cane berries or, or the brambles like the blackberries, raspberries, anything like that um, is going to provide a shelter. It's going to be a thicket. So again, when we think about right now, they're thorny and we got berries and we're reaping the harvest and they are too, but as we move into the fall, um, that's still gonna provide a shelter for those birds. We can also um, do the same thing with elder berries or mulberries. Any of those are gonna be um, food for birds and various wildlife species throughout the winter months. Um, even privet, I didn't put a picture in here of that, but as much as some of us hate privet, and we know that's become an invasive species, um, it's still good food for the birds. One that you've heard me mention um, back in February are the, the choke cherries and the choke berries. Um, the choke berry is aronia, so that's a really healthy um, berry for us to be consuming, but it's also an excellent fruit um, for our wildlife species. So a lot of different mammals are going to eat on all of these berries. This is one of my favorites. This is the Carolina spice bush. Um, make sure that you nab one of these and get this planted. Um, it it thrives even in moist riverbanks, wetland areas, swampy areas in your yard, but it's also going to be okay in dry sun. I've got them in both locations and it amazes me how tolerant this plant truly, um, truly is, but it also is going to provide a great um, habitat. Now here's one, we do have native species, the Lonicera species, the honeysuckle, but then we also have invasive species. Um, but if you're going to encourage wildlife, um, the, the true native species is going to be an excellent source of nectar for various birds, butterflies, and, and bees. And then we also have winterberry, which is a type of holly. So again, um, it's going to be a nice contrast to your landscape in, in the wintertime because all you're going to see really is the red berries, so it's really pretty tucked against the snow, but it's going to provide a great source of food again for the wildlife. You've heard me mention this as well. This is the Sarvis berry or the service berry or June berry, kind of depending on where you're from, um, but this is one we're really encouraging folks to replace the Bradford pears with. Uh, we know that those Bradfords are self-hybridizing. They hybridize freely with everything else. That's why sometimes you'll see species that are thorned growing wild, and you're starting to see trees, Bradford pears like that popping up everywhere. And that's why uh, you're not planting them, but they're being dispersed by um, birds, and then they're just hybridizing with one another. But uh, serviceberry is going to be about the same size of tree, 
but it's going to be more beneficial. Um, when we look at wildlife populations, they don't care for the fruit on the Bradford. How many of you know how bad they smell in the springtime? Well, that's a turn off to our wildlife as well. So they're not really serving a purpose in our landscapes or roadsides, pastures, anywhere like that. So um, this is a great tree to replace those with. Um, and then crab apples or any of our fruit trees are going to make really good additions. Hawthorn, this is a hawthorn here. Um, it's Well, you can see there it's going to provide a great source of nectar. And then we're going to move into the fruit trees, which are going to provide the fruit um, even rotting fruit in the fall is going to be a food source for even butterflies. So um, unless you've got disease on some of that fruit, you can just let it be and, and other critters are going to eat on the, on the niblets. Um, many folks don't think about dogwood as really being um, a tree for wildlife, but it, it truly is. They're going to attract all kinds of butterflies. So I kind of popped it in here rather than the butterfly gardening, but know that this would be a great addition. It's also going to be a great addition even to your moon garden too. So lots of many uses for um, the dogwoods. Many different um, hybrids on the market now. Just as an FYI, those Appalachian named dogwoods are coming out of the Tennessee program here. So we've got a lot of really cool specimens um, that are available for home landscapes. And then, of course, lilac is one that's a really good food source. We don't often think of that. That's one reason I put it in here, but it is a really great um, lure for different kinds of butterflies. But now we're not all going to want to be attracting, I guess, the same kind of butterfly. So um, later on in the presentation, there's a couple of graphs and charts in there that kind of tell you what plants attract which butterfly. So you'll kind of no, but this is also great if you um, like hummingbirds. So even though it's purple, we usually associate hummingbirds coming to red, but hummingbirds really like lilacs. And then we have the linden tree or the viburnums, the, the basswoods. All of those two are going to be great sources of cover and shelter. Um, it's going to just provide a lot of protection for any of those smaller mammals that we have cruising through the landscape. Uh, we can't omit the oaks or any of the nut trees. Uh, just planting an oak is going to really encourage those um, populations growing. Uh, we, we need to have that kind of cover. We know if we lose some of those bigger trees in the canopy, then that's when we have a lot of these smaller trees. We'll go back to the Bradford prayer that are going to encroach, and that's when they start to thrive. So as long as we can keep those canopies tall and high and vigorous and dense, then we're going to reduce some of those troublesome trees from taking hold. Um, any space in your in your garden or landscape is going to be suited to a wildlife habitat. You don't have to have a huge space. It can be even a 10 by 10 section that you're just creating to draw in those mass populations of birds and, and critters and butterflies, hummers, um, all of those those good trees. But you can kind of see the contrast here. We're including um, trees and tall grasses. You can see there, there's a lot of protection and cover. Uh, you don't see a lot of food right there per se right now, but there is a lot of food for wildlife too. If you're interested in being a certified wildlife habitat, there's some links on here that will provide you information and you can actually certify your own landscape. I think it's $20 to do that, uh, but it's really cool through the National Wildlife Federation. You can get a sign. I didn't put the sign up here, but I think it has this right here on it, but uh, make sure to check out those links. It's kind of cool if, if you're already growing for wildlife anyway. Again, just to make mention of the birds, um, it's going to depend on the species that you want to encourage or keep that you already have. So there's some links in here that will help guide that process. Um, also, if you have a little bit more space, um, the native grasses, the, the big blue stem, little blue stem, any grass, switchgrass, um, all of those, especially the switchgrass for bobwhites is going to, because they're clumping and they get really tall, so they're going to encourage bobwhites. Um, if you've ever walked through a field of switchgrass and inadvertently um, scared up a ball pot, I mean, it can be quite alarming, but it's really cool at the same time. And um, if you have enough space, you can plant that and you can hear the ball pot singing all the time. It's pretty cool. Um, our dreaded enemy for lots, uh, lots of you probably are the deer. So again, make sure you check out the deer resistant um, plant 
chart. Um, I don't have a problem with deer, so that's nothing I've really ever had to worry much about, but I know several of you have complained about them uh, for years, and there's no fence tall enough to keep them out. Um, they just keep encroaching. We encroach on their on their land, and so they're encroaching back on us, I guess. It's all part of that, that cycle, but anyway, make sure you check that out. So from wildlife, we'll move in and kind of funnel down into butterflies gardening and um, I put a little quote up there I can't read it because it's blocked off but anyway um, this is probably one of the easier gardens that we can actually grow um, some of the key features that we want to think about um, is that we we do want to have food for not only the butterflies but also the caterpillars uh, we do need to have a water source we do need to have a shelter. We need to have a place for them to warm up and lay their eggs. And then again, that chemical free environment is gonna be really critical uh, to sustaining their populations. So one of the biggest keys is just integrating um, mass quantities like you see here with different colors. Um, also giving them a place to warm up. This is kind of, a bad maybe example here but you can see that rock right there so those butterflies can come out and actually warm up on on the rock because as I put in the presentation they're not used to drinking coffee every morning like we are so that's kind of how they warm up in the sunshine um, even if you don't have a lot of space even these little stones like this right here or any kind of flat area is going to give them a place close to their food source that they can also warm up any type of rocks or gravel area is going to do that. And then of course, butterfly houses are trending now really big on the market. So um, you can purchase those, paint your own, create your own. But because the butterfly wings are so large and fragile, they also will need protection from um, heavy winds, thunderstorms, uh, lots of rain, or even predators from them. So this gives them a little place to fly into. You can keep it pretty simple, or you can even add uh, your own rustic charm and create your own butterfly houses. So um, almost looks like a bird fe feeder, but they do serve a really great um, purpose. So if you've never seen those or utilized those and you do have a butterfly garden, then you might want to check into one of these. Another thing is um, we call this puddling rather than, you know, how we have the bird baths that are a little bit deeper. For the birds to drink from but that's too much water for butterflies so we create these shallow pans like you see here uh, and that does have water in it. it's just not a very good example but we want them to be able to have a water source so you can just kind of create a little tiny um, water garden area something simple that they can drink water from or you can even tuck it away to where only the butterflies are going to see it but make sure that you do that because that's also going to provide them a source of um, minerals and vitamins believe it or not as well and like I said a minute ago when we have those falling apples falling fruit um, in the fall as long as they're not diseased leave those out there for butterflies um, I popped this picture in here because it's it's old bananas so if you you know, got five million loaves of banana bread in the, in the freezer, then take some of those old bananas and feed to the, the butterflies. Another source, of course, is going to be horse manure. So um, anybody that has horses, or if you want to encourage some of these populations, then you can certainly scatter that horse manure throughout your garden, or just if even if you just like say have horses, horses in the pasture, then they're going to go to that as a as a food source. So it's actually a source of nutrition for the butterflies. Uh, one quick thing is that when you saw that mass of color there a few minutes ago, you didn't see a lot of red. So kind of as a rule of thumb, it's not always true, but hummingbirds like red, butterflies don't. Um, they can't really see red, so it confuses them. And they, they smell, but um, they don't always see, especially if we have a single stem. That's why we say group those flowers in masses because they can access it easier than just the single stem or the, a lot of red like this. You can intermingle the red. You just don't want it to be all red. So just kind of keep that in mind. There's a lot of info on this slide. Um, notice that there's a couple of distinctions just to make mention. Uh, when we talk about butterflies, we want to have food sources 
for nectar, but we also want to have host plants because remember, we are feeding the caterpillars and the butterflies at different times throughout the year. So some of these you're going to notice are in the nectar and some of uh, the same ones are going to be listed as hosts. So you're going to get um, more bang for your buck with some of those. But um, Angelica is one of those right here. It's going to be a great host plant and it's also going to be a great food source for um, butterflies as well. Um, all of these right here, also just a few more that I thought of that wasn't on the list. So you can see from this that everybody can have a butterfly garden in essence. Just make sure that when you are planting to refer to some of those butterfly charts, again, to know what specific type you want to draw in, but also what you need to be feeding them. Um, make sure that you know the difference between the host and the nectar plant. Make sure you have a little bit of both to make sure that you're successful. And again, you don't need a lot of space to really be able to create these. And a lot of people we know now are wanting to draw in the monarchs. Uh, we've got several master gardeners here in the county that are monarch way stations. Uh, we also have all of our projects as, as monarch way stations. So that's a good way to, um, to register your landscape. This is the Joe Pie Weed. Uh, you'll see these covered up in August and September with butterflies. And whoops, as just a reminder, the monarch just kind of showing its life cycle there. And then also remembering um, the caterpillars. So if any of you have deal right now, you're probably battling the, the swallowtail caterpillar. So you, you go to bed at night and you get up the next morning, it's all gone, eat down to the ground. It's usually going to be this little varmint here. That's why I always say plant lots and lots of deal. So that way you're feeding them and feeding yourself too. Um, but here's some of those uh, charts I've been referring to. This is not all by any stretch of the imagination. There are so many butterflies, y'all. So many different kinds. Um, I really had no idea about this until a couple of years ago myself. So it's kind of fun now to be out in the yard and identifying some of these. This is kind of blurry, but like I say, the links are in, in there as well. Um, this is a, a website. This is the list of the butterfly host plant. And then there's also one for the nectar sources. So this is just a little snippet to show you how detailed it really is. So go to those websites. It's going to be in alphabetical order and it's going to tell you what, this is the host one right here. So like a hackberry is great for the American snout. Um, you can see that any of these oak trees, nut trees are going to be great for the banded hair streak. So you may not have those populations, but if you get populations of those plants, then you're liable to get those populations of the butterflies. So kind of working in tandem with the butterfly, a lot of times we um, think about water um, also. So as we talk about some of these water gardens, they're probably not all going to be as involved as what you see here, but we certainly can have something fancy like this. You can even see the, the fish in here. Um, they've created a, a dry or a stream bed right here. Lots of different things going on, but just, just remember it's, it's not all about being big. You can, you can have a cute, small, and charming little water um, addition in your garden. So this is kind of some of the fun things to think about, and there's web links um, embedded on those first couple of slides that'll take you to the how to do it yourself type thing, but um, old wine barrels are a great way. You can see here just adding a pump, even got some solar lights in there, um, got some moonlight plants. Very, very small. Same way with this little teacup. Can be like a tabletop uh, water feature for outside. Or you can bump up and have um, some of those stock tanks from the co-op or tractor supply and turn that into a rustic type water feature. Um, I've even seen where they'll come out on the outside and plan around that where you can't really tell that it's galvanized or some people will actually dig out a little ways into the ground and embed those into the ground. Um, we can use smaller galvanized tubs or even these larger trough size ones depending again on how much space you have but you can see from this just a really small um, water feature. Or you can get creative. I'm not really an engineer, so I'm not real good with that kind of stuff, but you can kind of see how they piece um, together a couple of different features in this slide, just using buckets and barrels or even clay pots and just assembling that in a way where you've got a little pump there 
And again, you can make a larger version of this as well, but that's also gonna be something really good to have for your butterflies. Uh, we can move up and be a little bit more contemporary in regards to style. You can kind of see how this one is, has been dug out into the ground, but it's actually really simple to make this, y'all. It's really cheap. It's just like $190 to create that. So um, hypertufa, if you're into making the hypertufa, if you've got some leftover, you can certainly create that into a water feature, as well as some of those um, old enamel ware. Lots of different ways we can incorporate those as a water garden, growing herbs and everything in there with that. And then we have what we call um, the fish tower. So this is really cool. There's um, a link to create one of those if you're wanting to do like a miniature pond, uh, just have a few fish, you can actually create this little beast here to go into one of those galvanized tubs um, and be able to see to see the fish and they've got airflow and they've got clean water in that area. So a little bit smaller scale than what you would for a real big pond or water feature. Um, if you've got old stumps, you can certainly create those into a water feature. A couple of different ways to do that. Um, this one here is actually a, a kid. It's not a real stump, but just to kind of show what that would look like. But you can do all kinds of things. You can kind of see the moss already growing on this one. And then they've just turned this in, into um, a spout, like a free flowing water fountain. And then you can just use plain old pots from the box stores to create a small water garden. And again, the cool thing about this is it's a bird water and a butterfly water. So it's also going to play into to the schematic of um, the wildlife as well. Uh, kits can become a little bit costly, but you're going to get all the stuff that goes with it. Um, so it looks real, but these are really lightweight. They don't hardly weigh anything. They come with the pump already in place. So you can just incorporate the plants as you see fit. Um, but some of those can be rather pricey. The larger you get, of course, the more expensive they do get. So from the water garden with this big rock, we'll move into rock gardens. So I thought this was a really cool picture, uh, just showing a multitude of annual plants that we could incorporate into a, a rock pathway or a rock wall, either way. Um, again, it's all about being unique and we can be as elaborate or as simple as we wanna be, just a few ideas here. This is what we would call a dry creek bed. So many of you have probably seen this or maybe even have one of these installed. Of course, the price here is going to be the cost of the rock, but um, even this one here is just using the little pea gravel, the river rock. So when we get a little bit of rain, you're going to have some water flow through there. Um, this would also be a, a feature typically that we would see within a rain garden element, um, but we can again be simple, we can be small, either way. Um, when we talk about rock gardens, it's not just the rocks that we have in our landscape. Many of you have heard me talk about the big rocks I have at my house. That's kind of what sold me on buying my house. But it's also the rock that you use as contrast, like you see here, just as the pathways. Um, instead of having pavers or concrete or just plain old dirt and grass, just in, in incorporating that just as a mechanism for contrast. Um, some rocks, like myself, you're already going to have those in place. So just use that existing landscape and bring it alive. Uh, with different plants and it it almost becomes a living breathing um, thing when we start in, including all the blooms. If you're into succulents, um, if you like the arid, more dry arid type plants, lots of many species that we can include utilizing uh, different rocks. If you've got a dry um, area in your lawn um, or in your garden that doesn't really produce anything really well, it's a great place to put a little sun garden, a little cactus garden. And of course, when we do talk about rock features, it kind of goes back to the to the water garden. But you can see where a lot of these elements kind of uh, crisscross with one another. But um, another way to just create a water feature using rock as the focal point. And this is one of my favorites. So we're going to talk about kitchen gardens later in the season. But if you've got a kitchen garden right outside your door, um, using these real rock to kind of frame that in and it almost looks more like a cottage garden or kind of the old colonial style how they used to to kind of frame those gardens and keep them um, within their boundaries. And then of course we can just xeriscape or rockscape. 
you can see here instead of there's a little bit of mulch here but not a lot got some foliage here but instead of using the soil to plant in they're using uh, pots and succulents and a lot of different rocks so again it's just a matter of preference um, even this would be considered a rock garden they more than likely brought these rocks in for placement but what's cool about this theme is that it's like the the japanese uh, conifer the japanese evergreen garden so it's focusing on those plants those um evergreens and you can see the multitude of colors there just from those conifer plants so that's kind of everything else is kind of mundane and simple but it makes those plants really pop and of course with rock we can also include a coastal type garden of course this is not where we're at in northeast tennessee we don't have that much water but if you like that element minus the water in the background you can kind of create something that's almost coastal um, looking and then the true cottage style um, gardens, just utilizing the rock to, to create the fences um, and have the beautiful foliage around the house or just a, a simple walled garden to kind of frame in some of your, your low lying plants to kind of feature those. So lots of different ways that we can get away with with the rock gardens. Now, if we're utilizing the rock, um, we've got multiple ground covers that we can utilize and then perennials and bulbs. Those are gonna make really nice additions. And I would recommend getting those perennials established first. Uh, you can kind of see there's lamb's ear listed in there as well, but any of the dwarf conifers, ferns, um, again, you can kind of go uh, for multiple effects here because remember rocks are also gonna be a component of those moon gardens as well. Um, you can always come back in and um, fill in, in the next year with your bulbs, kind of know where you've got some holes, and then come in last with those ground covers. Um, next week, we'll talk a little bit about mosses and ferns. I'm going to mention some of those um, for you because we've got a lot of different species of those. Um, moss is not always bad that we see growing in our lawns, but it can actually be a really nice um, addition to the landscape, especially with uh, rock gardens. And you can see here how folks have just placed um, the rocks intermittently. They're showcasing some of their um, juniper ground covers, the evergreen ground covers, and the flocks. So if you have a low line area or even a steep bank, um, sometimes that would work as well. And from here, we're going to move into tropical. We're going to finish up with tropical gardens. Um, there's a lot of different plants that we can get away with in zone seven here in, in Northeast Tennessee. Um, some are gonna be kind of, like I was talking about with the jasmine a little while ago. So some of it might be trial and error. Um, I know that there's plants I can't really grow successfully, but I have neighbors and friends that do. So um, some of these just be aware. You'll notice here that we're in pots. So some of these you might want to be um, including in pots. And that's the thing with these tropical, gardens or the tropical oasis is that a lot of these can be grown in pots and moved in and out but that's a lot of work so it's knowing which of these tropical plants that we can have all the time that we don't have to be moving about versus the one we need to kind of confine to the pots and and move around so we'll start out with a fun one bamboo <laughs> we actually consider that a tropical plant but uh that's to me an invasive species and I might have a little bit of trouble with that one uh, but you can kind of see there that it doesn't in fact form kind of a hedgerow but now this can be very invasive so I, I don't know if I would recommend that for everybody but it's going to be one of those that's going to um, it's going to perform very well and grow well here it's not going to be hindered um, by our cold winter months this one here is what we call oh what is this I always forget the scientific name, Col Colcasia, I think, better known as elephant ears. So this is one that we can actually get away with in some places here in Northeast Tennessee. So we can just leave it in the ground if we're just covering it up really heavy with a mulch in the, in the late fall, moving into winter months. So this is one that can just be standalone. You can kind of see how it's framing um, the rest of this bed right here. Um, hibiscus. Uh, this is one that probably is not going to grow in the ground. It's not going to stay in the ground, but you can kind of see how they've lined um, their drive with pots here. Lots of different ways that you could include this element in a tropical oasis, but just you might want to hide the pot, kind of nip and tuck 
um, where it looks like it's actually growing from the landscape. And I think I have a picture that shows that here in a few minutes. Um, hibiscus though are really easy to grow even in the pots, pretty easy to, uh, to get, a, they don't have a lot of disease, uh, not a lot of issues. Um, this one here is a palm, specifically the dwarf palmetto. And I put this one specifically because this one will grow here. Um, it will sustain itself um, pretty regularly, but you also see that it doesn't look like our typical palm, uh, but it can add a nice um, contrast and kind of frame in a type of um, tropical paradise, if you will. Here's the big one. We know that canna lilies and calla lilies um, can be quite large. Um, the canna lilies kind of in there with the elephant ears and then we've got a bunch of low growers in here with a lot of bright color. So that would be kind of reminiscent of a tropical oasis too. Um, and even getting some of those palm trees, especially like by if you've got a swimming pool, these would do quite nicely tucked away in, in, the, in the edge of a swimming pool area. Um, the hardy banana trees, uh, we can make those look very tropical. They're going to look very similar to a palm tree. And these are ones that we can just leave all year long and they're going to keep coming back. So you can actually use that to frame in a deck, kind of like you see here. And that's going to give you a lot of height as well. Hostas, we're going to throw these in here too. Um, with the tropical paradise, we can create a huge mass that look, looks really lush and, and succulent. Again, very reminiscent of a tropical um, landscape. And then you can kind of see how we're incorporating a lot of different elements here. Um, one plant that I don't have listed in here, and I just thought of it looking at this, um, Bird of Paradise. Um, you can grow those in pots and kind of tuck in some of these lower areas and that would give you a burst of color um, as well. But you can kind of see some of these different colors. Um, plus you're getting a lot of ferns. And like I say, next week, I'm going to give you more information on ferns specifically. But we'll often lump ferns in there as a tropical, just because again, they're giving you that really lush bounce of foliage. These are really cool. These are the Apaganthus um, African lilies. And the reason we put those in as a tropical plant is just because of the foliage and then you're getting that really bright contrasting um, color. So they would sit real nicely against or canna lilies and the elephant ears as well. It'll kind of help frame some of those holes in if you've got hibiscus in pots or something like that, for instance. And then we have the, I have trouble with saying this one, y'all, bougainvillea. Um, but these need to stay in pots. That's why I chose the picture next to the swimming pool, but a lot of times you'll see this um, in our landscapes here. Uh, they are beautiful, very prolific bloomers throughout the season, but you got to take them in and out because they're just not going to make it through um, our winters. And then we have yucca plants. We've seen those blooming here in the last couple of weeks, and we know that we can get some medicinal uses out of those too. Um, not only that, but you can see that they would make a great addition to a moon garden as well as a rock garden or a desert oasis or a tropical oasis. So a lot of place that we can kind of tuck, tuck in the yucca, kind of hide um, maybe some other areas of our landscape that we don't want others to see. This is the Mandevilla. It's also going to be very similar to the Bougavillea. That's a hard one to say, but this is also one that you're going to have to bring in in pots, but you can kind of see how that pot's hidden, so you can't really tell that it's in a pot. Um, but it's a pretty prolific bloomer too, and it binds. I don't know if you can see the trellis support there, so you will have to have a trellis for that one as well. But lots of different ways you can manipulate these to, to get a more tropical feel. And a lot of um, Grasses are going to give you that same kind of tropical feel. This is a Miscanthus uh, sinensis, Japanese silver grass, and it's going to get a lot taller than that too. So it can also be used to frame in some of those pots or smaller plants that we're having to move in pretty regularly. And this is uh, what a lot of people call the dinosaur plant. It's Darmera peltata, but you can see there it's a, a unique, interesting type foliage. Uh, but it's going to be a shade plant. So it's going to be a shade lover versus a lot of those other tropical type um, plants. So kind of a cool little foliage addition there. And then this is our uh, pineapple lily. You can tell there how it gets its name. Really low grower, almost considered a ground cover, um, but it's a nice little edger. It will withstand temps down to about negative 10. So 
I've never seen this plant for sale here, but um, according to our zone, it will do okay in zone seven. And then the passion flower. This is our native um, species in Tennessee, but it's also going to be kind of tropical in nature. It was the, the Spanish missionaries that brought it to us and, and help, helped us get to know this plant many years ago. So you can kind of see how they're framing in that doorway. And it's just a beautiful pop of color. And we've got different colors of the passion flowers now as well. And then this is the Coeur line. It's winter hardy. It can take colder um, climates a lot better than like the bird of paradise I was talking about. And if you know the bird of paradise, it kind of looks similar, except you get more color here versus on the bird of paradise. Um, another plant to consider when we were talking about hibiscus, I think I said this, but the Rosa Sharon, um, it kind of has some of those same unique qualities of a hibiscus, but it's going to be cold hardy for this area. So that might be something that you could put in a permanent location and you're not having to move around a lot. It's going to have that big flower, um, very similar to the hibiscus. But this is a really nice contrasting plant. It would go really good with um, many of the ferns or those little dwarf palmettos. And then this is a Gunnera manicotta. I have never seen this before. To me, it looks like giant grape leaves, like on steroids or something. It's pretty, pretty huge, but um, it can usually withstand a low temperatures without any protection. Um, this one will, can be grown all the way down and grown six, y'all. So um, this was a new one to me. I've never seen this before, but it does take up a lot of space. <laughs> And then this is the Eucharas or the coral bells. This is another little species that uh, most of us here in the Appalachians know and love. We can get varying um, colors of foliage and of the bloom. It's really nice and, and tidy. Um, it's also gonna go really good in any kind of rock garden or water garden or even those moonlight gardens. So um, Eucharas are one to, to really get to know if you don't have these in your, in your landscape. And then we have the caladiums, which the caladiums are kind of uh, kind of touch and go for this area. I know people that have grown them successfully. I'm not sure how, but I know that they have. But uh, a lot of people will dig these in the fall and store those for the next year. But you can kind of see how that's framed in that water feature there along that rock wall. And it makes a really nice uh, tropical setting. And then here you can just see the masses of the banana trees and elephant ears, some of those different ones um, up against the green grass. So again, very much tropical in nature. Or if you're more for the color and including um, the, something that looks like one of those Japanese arbors, um, you can see there lots of different plants that we can use to achieve that tropical feel in a very small confined space. Same thing here. Um, the thing about some of these tropical plants is that they do require a little bit more space. And then you can see there with the banana trees, I'm not sure what the red one there is, but lots of pretty color and contrast in a very small area. So imagine hammocks out there or um, whatever, just relaxing um, by the pool or whatever. Okay, y'all, so that is all I have for tonight. But I hope that's given you some ideas on some cool features to maybe incorporate. And like I said, there's a lot of links that's embedded in that PowerPoint. It's already been uploaded um, to the Google Drive. So make sure you check that out. If you don't have the um, access or whatever, I'll send you out that information tonight. So you'll have access to that. And the video will be on the web portal tomorrow along with some other resources.